Hi, my name is Elise or Sauce, and this is my Continental Divide Trail through hike gear list review. I started hiking in April going north and finished in mid-September at the Canadian border. My base weight for this trail was about 11 pounds if you don't include my camera gear, which I'm not for this video because most people wouldn't be carrying that. Um, and it also doesn't include any consumables, so no water um, or food. If you are interested in a video about my camera gear, go ahead and leave a comment below and I'll do my best to make one. I did also switch a few things out as I went based on need and seasonality. So obviously I needed different gear in the desert in New Mexico than I did in the Southern San Juans. I have talked about some of this gear in my PCT gear list review video, but I will update my experiences with each piece based on how it worked for me on the CDT. Finally, I'm a strong believer in using the gear that you already have. So if you're watching this video for recommendations and you already have something that works for you just fine, um, don't stress too much. It's probably going to keep working for you on the CDT. For sizing references for different pieces of gear, I'm about 5'8 and 150 pounds. Starting off strong with the gear that holds all the other gear is my Superior Wilderness Designs Long Haul 40. This is the backpack I used before and on the entire CDT. Um, it worked really well for me. Although it's called the Long Haul 40, this is actually a 50 liter capacity pack when you include the mesh and the water bottle pockets, and I found that size to be perfect for me on the CDT. I don't have super bulky gear to begin with, and it left plenty of room for long food and water carries. Some other features that I really like about this pack is it's customizable. Superior Wilderness Designs has a bunch of different options that you can add to their packs. I really like this external pocket up here. I used it to keep my headlamp um, so it was easily accessible if I ever needed to night hike. Um, I also really like this Lycra shoulder pocket. Um, I keep some electronics in there, things that I need easily accessible. I really like uh, the roll top compression straps to help sort of condense all of the gear that I have in my pack and it also is kind of nicer looking in my opinion than the kind that clothes on top. It has a really comfy hip belt. It carries really nicely. Another feature that I really like is the frame is removable so if you don't feel like you need it for maybe a shorter weekend trip you can take it out and save some weight that way. I did actually take the frame out for all of New Mexico and even though we had some really long water carries it felt pretty good. I really like um, the material that it's made out of, which is X-Pack. It's waterproof, so you don't have to worry about water soaking through when it's raining um, and you don't really need a pack cover. That being said, it's not seam taped. You can add seam taping, but I didn't. Um, and so water can leak in through the seams and how I compensate for that is I just use a trash compactor bag to keep all of the gear inside of my pack dry, even if some rain leaks through the seam taping. And that worked really well for me. The only real wear and tear I've seen on this pack after 3,000 plus miles most likely is um, some of the mesh is getting a little worn out. I feel like that's kind of standard for mesh. Um, that's happened on other packs that I've had as well. Um, and then also the foam and the shoulder pads have started to get a little thin. Um, and again, that's happened to me with other packs also. And so how I fixed that on this pack is I ordered these Z packs shoulder pads and those were a game changer for me. They made a huge difference. They gave this backpack new life and I really recommend that if you have thinning shoulder pads on any pack really. My only other complaint about this pack is the way that the water bottle pockets tighten um, but I do believe Superior Wilderness Designs has actually updated that and I think their new packs come with sort of already bungeed water bottle pockets. The only reason that's a problem is sometimes if I only had one water bottle in here, uh, it could fall out when I bent over or something. Overall, I really love this pack and I will be definitely taking it on more trips with me in the future. Next up is my tent. This is my trusty Z-Pax Duplex. It's the same tent that I carried on the PCT and I brought it with me again on the CDT. One thing to know about my tent is my partner and I each carried one. Um, I hiked this trail with my fiance, Josh, and he carried the duplex most of the time because he got to camp before me and I carried his pleximid. I'll start off with the positives. I think this tent is an absolute palace for one person. It's extremely durable. It survived all sorts of storms for me on the PCT and the CDT. Um, and I love how light it is. I also love that you don't have to have a ground sheet. Um, we did use one. I'll get into that in a bit. But um, overall, I feel like it's one of the best tents on the market for the weight and the size. 
That said, when Josh and I shared this tent, it was a little tight for two people. I have had this tent for three years now, probably over 5,000 miles, and it's held up for me really well. But with two people in it, um, I think we were pulling on the sides sort of of the tent and the zippers sort of started to malfunction. So they would pull apart a little bit. We tried a few different remedies. Those each helped for a little while, but over time, the zippers on one side specifically just weren't closing all the way. Another issue that we started to have with this tent is I think the seam taping started to wear out, um, and in really heavy rainstorms, we would start to get some puddles on the bottom of the tent. It wasn't anything huge, it was still definitely manageable, but obviously not the most ideal when you're used to the tent being completely waterproof. It also is a single wall tent, so with two people, it was harder to avoid touching the walls when there was condensation, um, but usually we could avoid a lot of condensation if we kept both of the storm doors open. All that said, um, before the zippers started to fail and before that seam taping started to leak a little bit, we used this tent for many, many miles, probably all the way to Montana before we felt like it might be time to try something different. I'll still probably use this tent by myself on trails. I think for one person, this tent is great, it's a palace. For two, it's a little bit tight in my opinion. I think I've become a firm believer in couples sharing three-person tents just after our experience on the CDT. Obviously, we did use this tent most of the way, um, so we made it work. It's possible if you really want to save some weight, but overall, I think a three-person tent for two people might be a better option. I would buy this tent again. Um, my only complaint about it is that it's not super affordable. I think it's $700 for a new duplex, so I might be looking into alternatives that are a little bit more affordable, but comparable in weight and size. Can't talk about the tent without talking about tent stakes. Um, I have a pretty tried and true method that I've developed over the years, and that is using four of these Z-Pax titanium hook stakes on each corner, and then two MSR Groundhog Minis on the guy lines. Uh, these Z-Pax Titanium tent stakes don't grip the ground as well, so if it's ever looser dirt or something, I'll put a rock on the top and that works perfectly for me, and then the MSR Groundhogs stay really well just because of the way they're designed. Um, and that combo has always worked really well for me and it's pretty light. Although the duplex doesn't require a ground sheet, we did use one just for extra peace of mind with our blow up pads and just in some of the more sketchy campsites that you can come across on the CDT. Um, and we really liked having a Tyvek ground sheet. We started out with a Polycro or Polycryo, I always forget how to pronounce that. And New Mexico just tore that thing to bits. On the PCT, I had a Polycro that lasted me like over a thousand miles. Not the case on the CDT. Um, so we switched to a Tyvek and that was a lot more durable for us. All right, next up, I've got my sleeping bag. This is again, a tried and true for me. Uh, Z-Pax Classic 5 Degree. I don't believe they make five degrees anymore. I think um, it's 10 degrees and up now. Um, and I would say, honestly, this is probably truly more of a 10 or 15. However, I've used this both on the PCT and the CDT, and obviously it held up for both trails, which I'm very impressed with. Um, I haven't had any issues with the baffling or the zippers or anything like that. Over time, anything down is going to lose some warmth. It can lose feathers, and obviously as there gets to be dirt inside the sleeping bag, it just starts to have an impact on how warm it is. Knowing that I've had this sleeping bag for a long time, I did expect to maybe have to pick up a liner to sort of supplement um, the down that it may have lost over the years. But overall, this served me really well, both on the PCT and the CDT. The only thing that I started to notice is it did lose a little bit of warmth overall, also definitely in the foot box. I've repaired a few holes in it and I've washed it twice. Um, and washing it really does give new life to your down. It fluffs it up quite a bit. Overall, I am on the lookout for a replacement just because over time I think this has lost some warmth, but it did last me 5,000 plus miles um, and served me pretty well. So a common theme that you're going to end up noticing throughout this gear review is I am a pretty cold person. Um, so knowing that and knowing that my sleeping bag was a little bit older, I anticipated picking up a sleeping bag liner at some point. Um, when we found out we were going to be going into the San Juans in mid-May, I figured now was the time, and I picked this up in the REI in Santa Fe. It's the Cocoon Silk Mummy Liner, um, and I was basically just looking for the lightest and warmest option. Silk seems to be the go-to for that. This adds about 10 degrees of warmth, um, and I really liked having it during some of the colder stretches of trail. A liner is also a great option if you want to elongate the life of your sleeping bag to kind of put a guard between the filth on your feet and the inside of your nice down sleeping bag. 
Moving on to probably the bougiest thing I did on this trail and why my base weight was a little higher than it was on the PCT, I carried two sleeping pads. If you know me, you know I'm a big fan of the foam pad. I love to have it to lay out on during the day. Um, I've always used the Thermarest Z-Lite Sole. This is the short version because I don't find that I really need the long version. Um, and overall this pad was pretty durable, it lasted me the entire trail and I actually got this after the PCT so I've done a lot of backpacking trips before the CDT on this and overall I, I just love being able to lay on this during the day. It also provides extra peace of mind knowing that if my foam pad popped and for some reason I wasn't able to repair it, I would have still some insulation. The blow up pad that I used is the Thermarest Neo Air X Lite, again the short version could kind of justify carrying two to myself knowing that they were both short versions I guess um, and this pad is actually Josh's from the AT in 2016 he also took it on the PCT in 2019 and then I took it on the CDT in 2022 so this pad has been through a lot and has actually never popped and never been repaired um, and I really love just having a blow up option especially with some of the more volatile campsites on the CDT. There might be rocks or roots since there's not as many impacted sites and having an air pad made it a lot more comfortable to sleep. The combo for me worked really well. I don't think I'd do it again in the future. I kind of talked myself into it and it was a little too heavy. I think in the future what I'll do is get um, a shorter sit pad and just suck it up during the day and then probably sleep on an air pad. Moving on to packed clothes, and first up we've got rain gear. Um, this is a Rab rain coat that I actually just found at an REI garage sale. It had a small hole in the shoulder, and I repaired that and have been using it ever since. I used to be a big Frog Dogs fan, but I really wanted something I wasn't going to have to replace on the CDT, and it did rain a lot, so I think quality rain gear is definitely something to consider for this trail. That said, I didn't do that much research, I just found the cheapest thing I could that was waterproof, not water resistant, that's a key, um, and it worked really well for me. It did soak through at one point during like this crazy four hour rainstorm we had in the Wind River Range, and so for that reason I would actually consider maybe carrying an umbrella for the entire trail. I'll talk more about that later, but I think it'd be something that'd be really nice to have in continuous rainstorms. For my rain pants, I also upgraded from regular Frog Togs to the Frog Togs Java Toad 2.5s. I would say these are really similar to like the REI rain pants, but for a way more affordable price. Um, so they're not the lightest on the market by any means, but they are a really good price, like $60 for the weight that they are. I think they're around 10 to 12 ounces. Um, and when you compare that with how much you have to spend to get any lighter than that, I think this is definitely a worthwhile, affordable option. They have vents in the pockets um, and in the back pocket, and then the part around the ankles unzipped, so it's easy to take these on and off without taking your shoes on or off. And overall, I really liked these to hike in even in cold mornings or when the trail was really overgrown to kind of protect my legs. For my base layer and mid layer, I carried the Melanzana Microgrid Fleece. I really love these for one, the hood. I love how this can tighten around your face and kind of also act as like almost a buff. Um, and I also really like the big pocket on the front. I'll put my hands in there sometimes if I'm not feeling like getting out my gloves. This thing has been through a lot and it's withstood the test of a lot of miles. Um, that being said, these are kind of hard to get. You have to get them by appointment in person only in Colorado. So I would say any microgrid fleece is pretty comparable um, and would be a good option for a mid layer. For my base layer bottoms, I started off with minus 33 merino wool leggings and those worked really well for me. I think they're some of the most affordable merino wool on the market um, and I really appreciate that about them. That being said, I ended up kind of switching things up down the road. When we were coming into the Southern San Juans in mid-May, um, my partner and I were a little bit nervous that we were going to need to hike in leggings during the day and we didn't want to be hiking in our base layers that we were sleeping in. So we stopped by the Dollar General in Chama, New Mexico and found these leggings that are 92% polyester and 8% spandex. They're the brand Just Be and they are incredibly soft. We did hike in these during the day quite a bit in the San Juans um, and eventually when that was no longer necessary I started sleeping in them because of how soft they are. I sometimes get a little itchy with merino uh, so this was a great little alternative. Josh also did end up getting me the Enlightened Equipment Torrid Puffy Pants. 
So that's ultimately what rendered my merino wool base layers kind of redundant. Basically, I was sleeping in these and then had my puffy pants as backup in case it got really cold. They were synthetic, so even if they got wet, they were still a pretty much a safe bet. And also, I could wear them at camp, etc. I love the Enlightened Equipment Torrid puffy pants. Um, they worked super great for me. I could feel instant warmth when I put them on. I loved wearing them around camp, and I loved having them as an extra layer in case it got super cold, which it did a few times, again in the San Juans, and then also up in Glacier in the north. One thing about the Enlightened Equipment pants to note is when I would squat in them, they would kind of come up on my ankles a little bit, so I ended up having to size up. So I would just say pay really close attention to their size charts. Having a full puffy outfit was a complete game changer for me, and the complement to my Torrid pants was my Mothbell Superior Down Parka. I also loved this puffy piece. This is only 8 ounces and really affordable when compared to the other puffies on the market, in my opinion. This is a great affordable option, relatively affordable anyway. Um, I felt like this kept its loft really well, and it was actually a really comfy pillow also if it wasn't cold enough to need to sleep in it. I loved the color. Um, it's got like an adjustable hood, um, an adjustable waistband in case you want to size up for layering but still keep some of the draft out. I thought that was really handy. Um, and overall, this puffy served me really well for the majority of the CDT. Next up is my trusty Carhartt beanie. Um, I just really like Carhartt beanies. I like how they look and I like how they feel on my forehead. Other beanies sometimes make me itchy. These ones tend to not do that. I chose Blaze Orange in case we were walking through any hunting seasons or just because it's nice to be super visible sometimes when you're alone in the backcountry. Nothing super special about this, it's just a beanie and I like Carhartt. Moving on to gloves, initially I brought these Sirius, I think, by Polar Tech gloves. Um, they're the same ones that I bought on the PCT and they are water resistant. Um, I had these in the beginning of the trail uh, when it first got cold in Colorado and they worked well enough. They are starting to wear out a little bit in the thumbs like where I hold my trekking poles. Um, these do start to soak through if you get enough water on them, even though they're windproof and weatherproof. Um, they're fine with like a light drizzle, but more than that, they do get a little bit cold. That said, I'm terrible at remembering to get my gloves sent back out to me at the ends of trails. So I ended up picking these bad boys up at a grocery store in Montana and they worked perfectly fine for the end of the trail, even though it got super cold and glacier a few times. I think in the future my winning combination is going to be something like this, a fleece or wool glove with a DCF or some sort of rain shell over them. Uh, the times that my hands got the coldest on this trail was when it was pouring down rain and so I think a glove alone really just isn't enough unless it has like a true waterproof casing, at least for me. Some extra miscellaneous clothing that I carried were sleep socks. Um, they were just actually really lightweight, darn tough running socks, so not from a warmth purpose, but from a, if I couldn't get all the dirt off my feet and I didn't want to put them in my sleeping bag purpose. I picked those up initially to have some lighter weight socks in the desert, and then I just kept them around as an extra layer for night. I also carried some swimming underwear specifically for when I wanted to take alpine dips in the summer. I used Patagonia Barely Hipsters. I actually carried those as my main underwear initially, but in New Mexico they were causing some chafing, so I retired them to just swimming underwear and picked up some different underwear to hike in, and I really loved having that option so I could change into something dry, or those also dried really quickly, so if I wanted to just keep hiking, um, that worked out really well for me. Finally, I have my trusty camp shoes. I love these things. These are actually still the same ones I had on the PCT. They're just shower shoes that I found on Amazon. I'll link them below. And they're super lightweight. They're like three ounces. They're great for just keeping your feet clean at camp if that's all you want out of your camp shoes. Um, I wouldn't recommend them for hiking in or really water crossings or anything like that. They're not sturdy enough for that, um, but they're great just to wear around at camp. I did not cut these to be ultralight, but I did end up cutting off some foam one time when I needed extra padding in my shoes because I wore them too long. Um, so if you wanted to make them even lighter, you could do that too. Potentially the most important items of clothing that I had were the ones that I hiked in every single day. I started the trail with this Outdoor Research Echo Sun Hoodie and I thought it served me very well. 
One thing I really liked about this hoodie is how lightweight it felt. Having long sleeves in the desert I think sometimes can be a little bit smothering, but this fabric is kind of the perfect weight for it. I never felt too hot in this um, while also having plenty of sun protection. I never had any tans get through or anything like that. It also has a hood, which is great for being able to keep your neck out of the sun, and it has a little hole to stick your ponytail through if you have long hair. This is an older version of the Echo Sun hoodie, and I think they've made a few improvements. Um, one thing that I don't like about this older version is it has like a weird sleeve thing going on. So instead of having like a thumb hole, it has this weird like fold over thing, um, which means you can't really like hold anything or do anything with your hand when it's over it, which it's, I'm sure helps to keep your hands out of the sun, but it's not really that practical. Another thing I didn't love about this was it did seem to pill really quickly early on. It never resulted in any holes, so ultimately it was okay, but from an aesthetic perspective it was a little bit annoying. My partner had the newer version and his didn't do that, so maybe they've made some improvements to the fabric. I ended up switching this out for two reasons, one being I love a good outfit change up in the middle of a through hike when you're wearing the same clothes every day it's nice to be able to switch it out another reason is because this is synthetic it started to reek like two days out of town i could barely stand spelling myself um so it was time for a change up I ended up switching to this mountain hardware crater lake long sleeve crop um, I thought it was really cute and it was in a gear store in steamboat springs so I went for it and picked it up this fabric is really, really soft, so it's very comfortable. It's also lightweight, not quite as lightweight as the Echo Sun Hoodie, but um, it still worked okay all through the summer. I didn't feel too smothered in this either. It does have thumb holes, which I really like. All that being said, it did start to wear out a little bit. I started to notice um, that where my backpack would sort of pull on the shoulders, I was getting some tan even through the UPF protection of the shirt. Um, I never got burned, but it was a little bit concerning knowing that this was supposed to be keeping me protected from the sun. It also got some holes where the thumb holes came through, um, but obviously I was wearing this every day for thousands of miles, um, so somewhere is to be expected. Overall, I still think it's cute and I'd buy it again. The cropped shirt also paired really well with my high-waisted shorts that I wore for the entire trail. These are the Belief Flyleaf 2-in-1 compression shorts, um, and it took me forever to find a short with spandex built in underneath. I feel like they used to be easier to find, but for some reason when I was searching for trail, it took me forever, so I was stoked when I found these. I think that having the spandex underneath kind of helps me personally from chafing quite a bit, um, and I liked the style of these. I liked that they were high-waisted. These were also pretty durable for me. They got some sun bleaching, as you can see, on the spandex portion, and ultimately that did lead to some holes, I think, just from wearing them for so many miles, but none of the holes were consequential. I was able to still wear these shorts for literally the entire trail, um, and they worked really well for me. I also have a code for these. If you use Elise Ott, you can get 10% off if you're interested in trying them. They're also really affordable compared to a lot of athletic shorts. I sort of mentioned the underwear I hiked in earlier. Um, I used the Auden Target underwear. It's something I started on the PCT and I just fell in love with. I like how they have no seams, so it's really hard to chafe in them, at least for me. And they're super lightweight, they're super breathable. I think they're a great option for hiking underwear, even though they're not necessarily made for athletic performance. When it comes to socks, I'm pretty basic. Like most hikers, I wear darn tufts. I started out the trail with some darn tufts that I've had for quite a while, so they eventually did end up getting holes somewhere in Wyoming. Luckily, there was a gear store in Lander that did a darn tough sock exchange. If you don't know, darn tufts have a lifetime warranty, so whenever you get a hole, you can replace them either through mailing them to the company or through a gear store that does the exchanges. And so I was able to replace them in Lander, and I don't know what it was about the batch that I got there, but I did get holes pretty quickly in those ones as well. Um, I think I might have gotten a different weight or something without realizing it, but ultimately the holes were inconsequential enough that I hiked the rest of the trail in those socks anyway, and I was okay. I didn't get any blisters or anything. I also really liked the quarter length socks. It gave me a pretty stellar tan line on the trail, and overall, still love darn tufts. Still gonna wear them hiking all the time. Also on this trail, I wore my trusty 
Lululemon sports bra. This is the same sports bra that I actually wore on the entire PCT. I'm extremely impressed with it. Um, I wear this all the time in normal life as well, which if you know what hiking clothes end up smelling like, you might think is gross. I swear this thing does not take on that stench the way a lot of other clothes do. It's also held up immaculately. There's no holes, there's no torn seams, anything like that. So I'm very impressed with Lululemon and really love this sports bra. The last thing that I added to my worn hiking clothes on this trail was a hat. I'm not normally a hat person. I don't like how they look on me usually, but with all the sun exposure on the CDT, I knew I needed something to protect my face. So I was on the hunt for a hat that I actually liked. Um, in Buena Vista, I found this Howler Brothers hat at um, a gear store there, and I really liked it, so I picked it up. Um, some things I liked about it were the material, it's sort of athletic feeling, um, which made me feel like I could wash it pretty easily. I really like the clasp on the back. It's not like one of those snap ones or Velcro. It's like this little buckle thing, which worked really well for me. I could take it on and off easily and put it on my pack while I was wearing my beanie or something. One thing to watch out for with hats, I think, is this mesh. I didn't realize at first. I was parting my hair down the middle to put in braids sometimes and I would get a burn on my part, so I had to stop doing that. And then another thing about this hat in particular is when it rained on me, the red of the hat started to bleed into this patch. It never bled onto my skin or anything, so not a huge deal, but it did make the hat look more weathered more quickly than maybe you might typically want. Finally, arguably the most important piece of all my trail runners that I wore were Ultra Lone Peaks. I did switch to Zero Drop for the CDT, and let me tell you, the break-in period is probably longer than you think. I started wearing Lone Peaks well before I hit trail and still had some adjustments in the first couple weeks where my feet were pretty miserable. That being said, having the wider toe box was a huge game changer for me and I definitely needed it with my super wide feet. Overall, these shoes worked really well for me. Each pair lasted at least 500 miles. I pushed some to over 600. I always switch my shoes out though around 500 because I worry about the midsoles uh, breaking down and potentially causing injury. So I didn't really try to push them farther than that. I thought they were super breathable. They dried pretty quickly, although I did feel like they retained a little bit more water than the Sockinis that I used to wear, um, at least initially, like right when you would go through a creek or something. Another thing to know is between the Lone Peak 5s and the Lone Peak 6s, in my opinion, they changed by a full half a size. So I was used to wearing 10s in the Lone Peak 5s, and then when I switched to the Lone Peak 6s, because that was all that was at the REI in Santa Fe, I had to go down half a size because it was so much larger. That being said, I think I am going to test out the Olympuses just for a thicker midsole for some more rocky and packed in terrain, especially those road walks on the CDT. The Lone Peaks can be a little bit thin for my liking. However, they did work for me for the entire trail. This won't apply to everyone, but I do wear prescription glasses and sunglasses. I've never been able to wear contacts. I hate touching my eyeballs. And especially on trail, it wigs me out with all the dirt that you're touching every single day. So I just use glasses and sunglasses from Zenni. It's super affordable, which gave me some peace of mind with like if I were to break my glasses or something. And also the case that they come with is like a hard plastic case that's pretty lightweight. So overall pretty convenient and you can always order a new pair. They keep your prescription on the website. So I like Zenni for a nice backup pair of through hiking glasses if you've never heard of them. Moving on to electronics. Like I said, I'm not going to include my camera gear in here, but if you want to see a video about that, go ahead and leave a comment. First up, I have my portable battery. This is the Anchor 20,000 milliamp hour. I took this battery on the PCT with me as well as on the CDT, and it has been a trooper. As you can see, it's a bit of a brick. It's pretty heavy. 20,000 milliamp hours might be overkill for a lot of people, but with all the electronics that I have, I like to have the peace of mind that I will have enough charge to last me an entire stretch. The longest stretch we went without town on the CDT was like nine days going through the Wind River Range. That's optional, you can go into town, we just chose not to. And this actually lasted me that entire time. I did run out of battery, but none of my devices died and it was like the day before we got into town. So I would say it was perfectly sufficient for a nine day stretch. In the future, I might consider something smaller. I think the 10,000 milliamp hour could work for the CDT depending on your usage habits, but it might be a little bit small considering there are some pretty long stretches in between towns. Maybe something like a 15,000 milliamp hour would be the sweet spot. For my headlamp, I used the Nightcore New 25. I absolutely love this thing. I got it on the PCT, brought it with me on the CDT. I think that this 
headlamp is probably the best option for through hiking that I know of. It's only an ounce. The white light is super bright. It has three settings. It gives me a lot of peace of mind when I'm not hiking alone, being able to turn it up that high. It also lasts a pretty long time. I can pretty much go in between towns without having to charge this at all, even with night hiking a couple of nights in a row. It also, of course, has a red light and it has two different brightness settings for that red light as well. Another electronic that ended up being crucial for me on this trail is the Garmin InReach Mini. I really like that this is smaller than the SE Plus that I carried before, and the Mini actually is only 3.5 ounces. I just did the most basic plan for this, which comes with like 10 text messages and unlimited presets. The nice thing about presets is you could text your family every single night with the automatic preset and eventually if you have a good habit of it you end up with a map of your campsites along the entire trail which is kind of neat and it gives your family peace of mind which is also nice of course. My partner and I also use this to communicate with each other whenever we weren't maybe going to make it to camp for whatever reason. There was this gnarly rainstorm right outside of Yellowstone one night and I had to hide under a tree for a little while and I realized I wasn't going to make it up our three mile climb before dark and I said, you know what, screw it, I'm just going to camp here. I was able to text him so he didn't worry about me all night. Another thing that we used the Garmin InReach Mini a lot for was checking the weather on the CDT. It can be very volatile and you're above tree line a lot so it's nice to have that extra way to sort of check in besides just reading the clouds. Of course you should always still practice lightning safety and not just rely on the weather reports on the Garmin, but it was a good way to kind of see what was going on if we hadn't been in town in several days. It does of course have an SOS feature. Hopefully you'll never ever have to use that. Um, I have had to use it before for someone else, not for myself. So for that reason, I think it is really important to carry a satellite communicator of any kind, even if it's not a Garmin. I did upgrade to an iPhone 13 for this hike. I wanted to be able to take nicer pictures and I hadn't upgraded in like five plus years. So I figured it was time. Obviously just take whatever phone you have. But one thing I wanna note with the phones is getting a nice, good, sturdy case. I used an OtterBox commuter series, which protected my phones from many a drop in many a different situation. Something else I always do is get the tempered glass on the screen. So I have dropped my phone face down and cracked it on a rock, but luckily the tempered glass saved my actual phone screen. I also just brought a four port wall charger so I could charge as many items as possible while I was in town. Um, I always usually at least stay overnight. So fast charging capabilities weren't something that was super high on my priority list. There are four port options with superchargers though, if that is something that's important to you. For headphones, I just use regular Apple corded headphones. Last but not least is this little Joby iPhone tripod. Um, I use this for when I'm alone and wanna take pictures or videos. Um, and it's pretty lightweight, it holds a phone. It doesn't hold like a big camera, but it worked well enough for me, just the iPhone. Um, I like how the little balls are adjustable. I have wrapped this around trees before or been able to adjust it to go on uneven surfaces and it's come in handy quite a bit. It's nice for like group pictures and stuff too. One of the pieces of gear I probably get the most questions about is my Garmin Instinct Solar Watch. Um, I really loved having this. I was able to track every single day on the CDT without draining its battery because of the solar aspect of it. I could track two full days usually without having to plug it in to charge. There are other tips you can use for saving the battery, like turning down the heart rate monitor or turning it off at night. Um, but overall, I would say reliably, you can get two days of tracking on this without plugging it in with the solar charging. If I wasn't activity tracking, it basically just didn't die, which was really nice. I think using this watch also meant I was checking my phone for mileage and stuff less because I could just glance at my wrist and see, oh, I've gone five miles or whatever. There's a bunch of different things you can customize. You can add different types of workouts, etc. Overall, I really liked having this, and now I have a track of my entire hike on the app that pairs with it, which is really fun to look back on. Next up, we have toiletries. I'm just gonna go over a few small things that I specifically really liked carrying. This mini bamboo brush came in handy for me on this trail. Uh, I also have carried this since the PCT. I love it. I'm not huge on combs. I have really fine, easily tangled hair, so this works better for me. And I'll use it at night occasionally while on trail and then also in towns after showering, etc. In addition to that brush, I also have a specific kind of toothbrush that I really like carrying. 
It's the travel kind that has a case that attaches to it. I'll link it below, but it's really hard to find in stores sometimes, so I usually have to order it on Amazon ahead of time. Um, but what I like about it is the casing goes over the toothbrush when you're not using it, so it can kind of protect it from other things in your pack. And then it also attaches to the back of the brush when you're brushing with it to give you an actual long-handled toothbrushing experience rather than having to be miserable and sticking your dirty hands in your mouth with a tiny cut-off toothbrush. The last thing I want to talk about is this trowel. I used to have a deuce of spades, but I actually ended up breaking that. I don't know if it was a CDT or if it was me, but uh, after several very aggressive cat holes, that thing literally just cracked in half um, and was kind of sharp and kind of scary to be carrying around. So I switched out to this Z-Pax trowel and I think it's a little bit thicker. It's shorter and thicker, so it's still the same weight, very lightweight, uh, but it's a little bit more durable and it still works really well for digging holes. I didn't have any issues with like roots or rocks or anything. Next up we have kitchen items. I had really bad luck with stoves on this trail, so I am actively seeking stove recommendations. I started out with my MSR pocket rocket that I carried on the PCT and that ended up getting threaded and no longer worked in New Mexico. After that, I replaced it with another MSR Pocket Rocket because it had lasted me so long. I was giving it the benefit of the doubt that it had just worn out, um, but that one actually ended up having the same thing happen somewhere in Montana. I feel like that was kind of fast for them both to wear out. When my second MSR broke, I did pick up a Jetboil Flash. Um, it was fine, it worked well enough for me, but it's a little too heavy and a little too bulky for my personal taste. It's a stove I would totally take car camping though. I like how it has the built-in sleeve and I like um, how it's all kind of a compact piece. For my pots, I carried this 700 milliliter Tokes titanium pot. It's kind of the perfect ultralight size for me. It's just big enough to fit an entire nor, an entire box of mac and cheese, a double ramen if you break it up enough, without having really any extra room, which I personally like because it means I'm not carrying extra weight. The Tokes pot does hold a full larger fuel can. So if you're one of the people who likes to carry the larger fuel cans, um, it does fit inside of there. Um, so I thought that this size of Tokes was kind of the perfect size for me. I like the structure of it. I like that it's short and squat rather than the taller versions. Um, I just like that better for cooking. It makes it a little easier to be able to stir and get into the pot. And overall, this pot served me really well throughout the entire trail. I pair my pot with this Sea to Summit long handle titanium spork. I think the most important thing about utensils is just getting the long handle one. It's great for like if you ever have a bougie backcountry meal that comes in like the resealable pouches, you're not going to get food all over your hands while you're eating, which is really nice. Um, and I personally like having a spork. I like having the prongs for picking at different things like whether it's cheese or getting to the bottom of the tuna packet. Another extremely crucial item for any CDT through hike is going to be your water filter. For my hike, I stuck with the Sawyer Squeeze. It's worked really well for me in the past and I saw no reason to switch away from this. It put up with a lot of the really nasty sources that we had in New Mexico and honestly all along the divide water can be sort of unpredictable. So I liked having a very reliable option in the Sawyer Squeeze. There are a few times where I pre-filtered from sources, so I used a bandana to get out the really large chunks before sending the water through my filter, just to make sure it didn't clog super easily. And then sometimes I even treated with Aquatabs after just because like one time we got water out of a tank that had a dead mouse floating in it and I just wanted that extra peace of mind. That being said, the Sawyer worked really well for me. I did not get Giardia, so no complaints here. One thing you can do to keep your Sawyer working really well for you long term is to consistently back flush it. And one thing I recommend for doing that is rather than carrying the syringe, they sell a little blue coupling that you can put on your clean bottle and then squeeze water back through the Sawyer while you're out in the backcountry. It's a little bit more streamlined than the um, big syringe and it works really well. It's also nice to be able to put it on like a hose and just shoot water through it when you're in town for a really easy back flush. Another game changer for me with the Sawyer was after you've had it for a while, try soaking it in vinegar. Sped mine up a ton and it's due to the calcium buildup that you can eventually get in the filter um, and vinegar got rid of that completely and made my Sawyer work like it was brand new. 
Another part of my general setup and also sort of my kitchen setup are the Superior Wilderness Designs roll top stuff sacks. They're made out of DCF and they are waterproof. So they're really durable. They um, can keep your clothes dry. I used one for a clothes bag and one for a food bag, um, which is really convenient if I ever needed to hang my food. I didn't have to worry about it raining overnight. And again, it was extra water protection for my clothes. I hung this every single night in grizzly country and had no issues with it. Overall, I really like these as stuff sacks. Um, probably any DCF roll top stuff sack would serve the same purpose. Another piece of gear that I really loved and carried with me the whole way is my through pack fanny pack. It's the Summit Bum Classic. It was the perfect size for me. I was able to store like my glasses in there, um, often my phone in this phone pocket in the back and I could plug my headphones into it and listen to them listen to music all day if I wanted to. I would keep like chapstick in here and often a lot of snacks. It's also waterproof. It's the same material as my pack, which is awesome. And it has this waterproof zipper on the top so you can keep things dry in the rain. I did add the comfy strap and that proved to be really durable and really comfortable throughout my hike. Um, I also put my bear spray on this the, using the holster that I had with it. And overall, I really liked having this fanny pack. Um, great to carry around town or while you're going to the bathroom on trail. I think this is a great addition if you are looking for a fanny pack. Another crucial item that I carried were my trekking poles. I use these to set up my tent as well as often to walk with, obviously. Um, these are my trusty Black Diamond Alpine Carbon Cork trekking poles. I really like having the cork handles because I feel like they're really durable and don't get as beat up as the foam ones can. I like having the flip lock extenders um, that just works well for me. And then also I have replaced the tips on these, which can give your trekking poles a really long life. These have lasted me over 5,000 miles and I'm sure will last me many more. Another thing that obviously was necessary for bear country was a bear hanging rope. Um, this is just a rope I'm pretty sure I found on Amazon. It worked well enough for me. You just want it to be long enough that you'll be able to reliably throw it over trees and hoist up your bag. Um, I think 30 yards is what they say in a lot of the national parks. Something else I really liked having that was actually my partner's was a rock bag. I didn't have one myself, but I stole his all the time. So I definitely recommend investing in one if you're gonna be hiking in bear country and need to hang your food. Some more items that I needed in the Southern San Juans in mid-May um, and that you also might need if you're going southbound starting in a glacier um, are micro spikes and an ice axe. Um, these are micro spikes I got before the PCT. They're still working really well for me. Nothing too specific. They fit over both my Saucony Peregrines and my Ultras just fine. So overall, I've never had an issue with these and they're pretty affordable. Another thing that I think is really necessary, um, especially in the San Juans in May, is having an ice axe for self-arresting. I took the Camp Corsa, which is pretty standard among backpackers. It's a lighter option. You're not gonna be using this for ice climbing or anything, obviously, but it will work if you need to self-arrest, which did happen to several people as we were going through the San Juans. Luckily, I did not have to, but I was ready to if I needed to. Another item that I wanna talk about is my mini Swiss army knife. It has little scissors, little tweezers, a little toothpick, and a little knife that I used all the time on trail. I used it for cutting cheese. Um, the scissors came in handy when I needed to doctor my blisters, which happened quite a bit in New Mexico. And the tweezers were great for things like taking out splinters, um, situations like that that might arise. Another thing that I really, really loved carrying was my Lightflex umbrella. Uh, it's super lightweight and it is immaculate sun protection, especially in areas like the Boot Hill of New Mexico and in the Great Divide Basin up in Wyoming. Um, I definitely recommend having an umbrella, at least for those sections where you're gonna be really exposed in the sun. I would say a lot of New Mexico you're exposed in the sun, so it's worth carrying an umbrella for, for me, it was worth it the entire state. I would even argue maybe keeping it for the rest of the divide just for rainstorms and also sun protection. You're above tree line so much on the CDT that honestly, you can't go wrong with an umbrella really in any state. One absolutely non-negotiable item for me on a through hike, especially after experiencing the winds in July on the CDT is a bug head net. I don't care what kind you use. This was like a super cheap one from Amazon. I think it weighs an ounce. For the sake of your sanity, please don't leave home without a bug net. <laughs> And that is it for my backpacking gear list that I used on the Continental Divide Trail. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this helpful. If you have any specific questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments and I will do my best to answer them.
If you found this video helpful, consider subscribing. I'm sure there will be more of them in the future. Um, and if you didn't find it helpful, I guess let me know that too. Thanks so much and happy hiking.